excited this Wednesday because I have an ambassador here to speak with everybody and like this is pretty cool. I always wanted to be a diplomat or ambassador somewhere so I'm getting closer by talking to one. So welcome ambassador. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. No, it's our pleasure. So may I continue on, on using Sujay from now on? Well, we call him, we use ambassador Sujay as kind of the nickname and that way it keeps it flowing. All right, I'm with it. I, I, know, I know this how it goes. And um, so best way to start would be if you can kind of formally introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and then we'll talk. Great. I'm Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook. They call me Ambassador Sujay for Susan and Johnson. I am a native New Yorker. I had the privilege of working for two presidents of the United States, President William Clinton and President Barack Obama. And the last placement was in the State Department as the first African-American, first woman, and first faith leader to be the U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. And what a delight it was, what an honor it was actually to uh, represent the American people and to represent and to work for the first African-American president. That was history and it was wonderful. I bet. And, uh, and that sounds like like memorable experience for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I covered uh, a lot of ground. I had 199 countries in my portfolio. So I covered 29 of those countries during my tenure and about 100 diplomatic engagements in the U.S. So covered a lot of ground. A lot of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> yes, yes. I flew for a few years on those miles. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. What's, what I'd like to know is how can we couldn't get it up to 200? Why was it stuck at 199? Well, they had some failed states that didn't have a relationship with the U.S. And so those countries aren't counted, uh, even though they're included in many of the conversations, but they're not counted <laughs> as official. <laughs> <laughs> I got it, I bet. So, you know, one thing I love to, to hear from people is, um, you know, everybody talks about their why and their what and this and that. But tell me, why do you do what you do? I believe everyone has a purpose and, and we plan our lives so that we can fulfill that purpose. And I believe that, you know, I've been very blessed by God. I really, you know, I'm a believer and I was born into a great family with great work ethics, Southern parents who moved to the North were poor at the beginning, but built wealth. And so I had the privilege really of being the beneficiary of some good people. So I do what I do because I think we're blessed in order to be a blessing, that we're supposed to take what we have, whether that's experience or knowledge, wisdom, and then share that with others so that they don't have to repeat the same lessons. They all have their own paths, but they don't have to make the same mistakes and they make their own and they find their journey and their purpose. So that's what I believe I'm here to do. Yeah, I, I love it. We'll talk a little bit later about influencers, but what you're talking about there is you're you're influencing based on how other people have helped influence you. Exactly. And then I try to influence others. Yeah, exactly. So it's the multiplication effect uh, rather than the subtraction, <laughs> uh, which a lot of people do. They get and then they subtract. Mine is get and multiply. And I think one of the first things we learn in school are our times tables. So, you know, one, <laughs> one and one is two, except when it's side by side, then it's 11. So you get much more impact. Exactly. Those... I remember those memories of those timetables. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. I also remember the Clairol commercial, what it said, and so on and so on and so on. It kept multiplying the people of using Clairol or something. <laughs> um, but there was it, I'm not sure it was theirs, but there was like only your hairdresser knows for sure. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I would say only the people in my inner circle really know for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I remember uh, a little dab will do it. I go back that far. That, oh, that was Prell. That was Brill Cream. Brill Cream. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. I go back with you. <laughs> I'm happy to be there with you. Um, so, so, you know, what's interesting um, is what you're saying. It's taken almost decades for, for corporate leaders, corporate brands to realize it's actually really good for business to be aligned with social impact. And it's actually also critical now to attract young leaders, especially 
They only want to go work where the, there's purpose. They want to make money too. That's not, you don't yeah. do it up, but they only want to go work where they do have purpose. They can make a difference. So you've been engaged in national, international relations, cross-cultural, um, business, education, uh, religious freedom, inclusion, you know, for almost 200 countries. <laughs> um, I'm kind of revealing the question here, and it's a little bit of a push because I'm asking you about you. What differentiates you as one of the leaders who cares? Ooh, well, because I'm the only me that I am, <laughs> number one. So I'm uniquely me, um, and I'm authentic. I'm authentic. I'm a leader of leaders. I think that that's what differentiates me. I think I have always tried to lift lives to new levels. I use a lot of alliteration, obviously, but I think that it's about, you know, people lifted me. They pushed me up forward and I really appreciate that. And so that's what differentiates me that I say, thank you. I write, thank you letters. I'm still from that boomers generation that we don't just send the email. We might do that, but we take a minute and we write a couple of lines that say, thank you for taking the time with me. So I think that that's what differentiates me. And I think many of the jobs that I've gotten or the appointments came as a result of people really knowing me and having had a relationship with me. It wasn't because uh, they just went through a phone book and said, this is a person we'd like to have on board or we've heard about, but that there was a relationship. And I think if this generation understood the importance of relationships, uh, that would keep them soaring and roaring. Soaring and roaring. I like that. And, and you're so right. At the end of the day, it is all about people. And, uh, you know, part of our business is executive search. And um, we always tell people, um, you know, write a letter. I mean, it shows you actually thought about it. it shows you actually really do care. I mean, email is great, but but it's even better. You know, um, my uh, yeah, grandparents. I tell children too. I mean, you know, when they get their little graduation gifts and checks, I said if if you can take the two minutes it takes to sign your name to the back of the check, then you can take the two minutes to write an address and a little. The cards are already printed. They have all the verbiage. All you really have to do is say love, whatever your name is. So take the two minutes and say thank you and put a stamp on there. It costs, what, 55 cents, you know? Yeah. And as MasterCard says, it's priceless, right? It really is. It really is. My job at Harvard, actually, I, I became an officer at Harvard, and it came as a result of writing a thank you letter. The dean of the Divinity School the year prior to uh, this appointment um, interviewed me for a professorship in preaching. And I didn't get that professorship, but I said, thank you for spending the time, taking the time to see me and spending the day with me. And a year later, he was on vacation in Paris. And he said, you know, Harvard just created this other program. I remembered you and I thank you for your card. Would you be interested? And the rest is history. So we never know where that little, then the stamps were 29 cents. We never know where that 29 cents will go. Yeah, you, you're, you're so right on. And I, I my, probably my favorite quote of all time, and I, I guarantee you'll know who said it, is um, most people will forget what you said. Most people forget what you've done, but they will always remember how you made them feel. Yes, yes. And, and yes. the famous or infamous Maya Angelou who said that. And yes. mm -hmm. right on. She also said another important line. She said, remember, people show you who they are the first time. You know, a lot of times we think we can change their personality just because of who we are, but people show you who they really are the first time and to remember that. And so to that's who they are and to be appreciative, but be your authentic self, but not try to make someone other than who they are. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 uh, she was brilliant. She was brilliant. Um, oh yeah. Definitely. You know, my, my grandparents and probably yours too would say, uh, a lot of times, and they had the, the Kiev Ukraine accent to go along with it. They'd say, as long as you have your health, that's the most important thing, right? Yeah. And, but it wasn't a line. It wasn't a cliche. They actually meant it because they worked hard and, and health was the most important thing. So I'd, I'd like to know, with all the exp experiences you've had, technology is changing super fast. And then we get COVID, which is a you know, incredible thing in itself. And then finally coming to, to tell you know, all the racial injustice and things we have to handle. Um, there's a lot going on, basically. But I think it's also given a little bit of an awakening. People have had some time to think 
about what's important in lives. And I want to know what's your thoughts on what our awareness is going to be or how our awareness is going to change when we're at work, when we're at home, or even in community. Well, you know, technology is the game changer. And I think uh, it was Gil Scott Heron, I believe, when I was uh, in school partying, had a song, This Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Um, but the reality is now this 21st century revolutions are plural televised. Yeah. And I think that the awareness of what particularly African Americans have experienced lifelong now has come to the world. People saw someone murdered on TV. Yeah. Um, and that's a game changer because for us, we're processing. We are still, you know, all of the things that happen to us lifelong actually come to the surface now. It's almost like a volcano that's been bubbling yeah. and now we have a chance for it to finally erupt. And so that's what you're seeing in protesters. It's like people have somewhere to place it where we didn't have anywhere to place it before. So I think life is going to be kind of before it was AD and BC. Now it's going to be pre COVID and post COVID and post COVID is, you know, we're dealing with race in America for the first time in a real way. Uh, we're dealing with, uh, illness that's worldwide and global um, and in a real way. And we're dealing with low wealth or unemployment that goes into poverty in a very real way. And so people are able to see the totality as opposed to in part. You know, I was on President Clinton's race initiative. Uh, the last two years of his presidency, he uh, formed the President's Initiative on Race. It was a seven member advisory board and I was one of those. And he was really trying to raise the race question because he saw the numbers changing, that there were going to be more black and brown in America than ever before. And it didn't get the certain steam or the attention because other things were going on in the world and in the White House. But I think now it's, it's like all of these worlds have converged at the same time. I, mar I was in Washington about three weeks ago when the Black Lives Matter mural was painted. Mm -hmm. And I was actually visiting on something else. And so a lot of the paths to the Black Lives Matter were passing by the hotel I was staying in. Uh, past so there were like seven different streams on the highway that was leading towards where I was staying, the sidewalk. And so when we got to where Black Lives Matter was, I walked with them. It was like seven streams converged into this one big thing. And that's really what we're seeing now. We have, you know, the stream of racism and the stream of COVID and the stream of narcissism all converging. And people are like, we have to do something now. Otherwise, we will explode or implode, whichever one you want to choose but we have to do something. So it's an action time. And I think that what's happening with Ingrid Vandervelde and myself and other partners and myself is we're saying, okay, we've got to do something. What can we do together? Otherwise we all perish apart. Yeah, and I think it's, um, it is an amazing time for opportunity. There's no doubt about it. And for, for education. You know, when I was a little kid in Montreal, side note, I, I read a book, um, Black Like Me, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. gave to me, which was in, has been impacted me forever, basically, because it's, it's not even like this person versus that person. That's the same person, just a different color. So you can't say, well, I like this one better than that one, even, even though you shouldn't say that. And um, so I've, I'm, I'm actually excited about the time and, and the diversity in the people coming together to say, like you said, we, we need change. Um, and and um, it, could be, it could be dramatic opportunity for, again, education, infrastructure, and, and equity, not just equality, but even equity for, yeah. for people to have property rates and, and own things. And, and, and in, to, in, the, in, in the redlining and all of the lack yeah. of capital access, I mean, all of those things, um, th there are times for corporations to do more than just remove the Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben's off of their shelves. It's time for real action. I mean, increase the number of African-Americans on boards, on corporate boards. I mean, most of them have one, if any. 
I mean, so you're talking about a nation that consumes your products, but is not represented in the making of them. So I think that there's time for real discussion, but real action on all levels. I worked in law enforcement for NYPD as a chaplain for 21 years. Yeah. And so I know that there are some good cops. You know, there we need some police officers to police our communities. Yeah. But we also need to have integrity and we need to make sure that people in our communities don't die at the hands of police unnecessarily. So I think there's a lot to be done. Um, I am ready to do more than converse about it because I've been at many tables for a long time. I've been at the table. So my thing is now let's get up from sitting and let's start acting and let's make some real change. I like to say, uh, there are many challenges, but if you take the little H and the E-L-L out of challenge, you get change. So we want to kick the hell out of challenge and make some change. Let's kick the hell out of it. I love that. Um, you know, it's um, there's a program we recommend to, to clients, and there's a reason this is called Leaders Who Care. We're recognizing leaders who care to make a difference out there, and mm -hmm. business leaders are going to have to have a big impact in that. And there's a program we recommend called Nonflict, which coaches people how to actively listen to each other, the keyword there being actively and not sort of kind of, and then make sure you heard the other person and then act upon it. Um, and and I, I think um, everything you say is, is fantastic. And I know, I know you've also been involved in, um, and I'm sure you know Brian Grimm in, in religious freedom and, and, and business, and that's a part of it. You know, to, to be honest, whatever faith you have or don't have, but to be part of inclusion, um, yeah, Brian and I are team members in bringing faith ERGs to corporate America, because just as people have their own affinity groups, they also need one for their faith. And we're seeing some remarkable changes with Salesforce um, and with Intel and with American Airlines. I mean, I think there are about 200 different corporations that showed up to one of his gatherings uh, just a few months ago. I was um, there. Were you there? I was there. So now, yeah, now I remember you. We were actually in the food line together, but we didn't know <laughs> exactly. we would have the conversation. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, it, it's really, really time. And so, I mean, there are many approaches, uh, but the goal is ultimately equity, as you said, you know, not just in racism, but equity and all walks of life and all arenas of life and i'm prepared to be part of that larger discussion that goes towards action and so you have non-flicked we've just created the global black women's chamber of commerce right. which is really to support build and scale black women-owned businesses i'm a third generation black woman business owner and when you have financial independence when you're able to make your own decisions and you have access, you can really do a lot of good in this world. When you're broke, busted, and disgusted, as we say, you're really at the hand and at the helm of someone helping you. So I don't want to have my hand out to receive the check. I want to have my pen ready to write the check. Yeah, and no, I, I think that's brilliant. When you're in survivor mode, you can't do anything. And if you're yeah. dependent, you, you can't really do anything. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about well-being, mm -hmm. and I think there's, there's financial well-being, there's physical well-being, there's mental well-being, and, and everybody has, deserves the right to have all of that. And, exactly. And yeah, we, not, just, not just in part, but the whole. Exactly. Yeah. The right to have all of that. And that's what makes a healthy person. That's what makes a healthy economy. That's what makes a healthy community and a healthy nation and a healthy world. So, uh, yeah, we can't all be collapsing at the same time. Someone has to be strong. And I'm, I'm, my vein is now to be entrepreneurially and economically strong and to teach others how to do that. Um, you know, they have the whole old adage, you know, if you fish for a man, then he only has fish for the day. But if you teach him, now her, to fish, then you have food for the village. So that's what we want to have happen. Yeah, no, um, I'm excited about, about doing stuff together. And I want to ask you one last question on this part is, pretend I'm a, I'm a graduate, high school, college graduate, and, and I come up to you and I say, man, I couldn't take my girlfriend to prom. I couldn't, um, I didn't have a, a graduation thing. I, just, I don't know what's happening with jobs. What do I do now? What's next? And you're a college graduate or a high school? Or high school, or a high school. 
Well, that's why God gives us this wonderful thing called creativity. I say two things that are needed. You need a mentor, someone whose who's arm or wing will they will allow you to walk under or next to that can also share, like I started this conversation with, share their wisdom, share their experience. And then you have these tremendous things called brains and minds that what's not there, you can create. My kids went to this high school that was wonderful and they had maybe 53 clubs. I mean, it was sort of like the Harvard for high schools. Mm -hmm. And they said, though, if they don't see what they want here, they can create it. And I think that that's really what we're going to have to do. We're going to see more innovation. We're going to see more um, initiation. Um, we're going to have to take the lead and take the helm. All those years of schooling add to something. So rather than the unemployment line, which you're staying in for eight hours, put down what you can do. What are your skill sets? What can you do to make a difference? And you can start right now. And I think we're seeing some brilliant creative things from young kids yep. as well as older folks uh, who are coming up with some ways to make this thing work for them. And that's what you have to do. Brilliant. By, by the way, we now call the older folks vintage. Oh, they're vintage. So I'm vintage. I'm a vintage boomer, uh, but I'm a, I'm a blooming boomer. I haven't stopped blooming. I still think as long as there's juice in us, kind of keep on going. And, I, and I'm, enjoy, I'm creating the kind of life that I want. And I think that's what more people are going to have to do. If you don't see it, what can you create? There's a, a book by, I believe it was Mel Blanchard and her husband. I forgot his name, but they basically had a restaurant in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And they used to vacation, and, and I believe it was St. Lucia, one of the islands. And they used to love going down there. And so they finally created, they sold the restaurant in Vermont, but they taught, no, before they sold it, they taught the islanders how to do the restaurant business. They opened up one in St. Lucia. They sent the islanders to Vermont so that they could figure out how to run it, and they moved to St. Lucia. And then finally they sold the restaurant. But the bottom line was that they wanted to be in St. Lucia. They had worked long enough and hard enough and put away enough to do it. And they said, we're gonna live the life we want. So it takes some time, you know, you can't do it overnight, right. but that's what work ethic means. It means work while it's day. And while you have workability, you have a mind, you have a body um, and use it. Well, you know, one famous basketball player before tragically being killed, um, Kobe Bryant used to say, way before he even died, he said, you should have that dream. Everybody wants that dream, that dream, dream. But one thing you should know is, right now is the dream. Yes, yes, yes. You're awake, you know? So, yeah, come on, let's do it. Let's do it. And I really appreciated him and the time he spent with his family. And uh, certainly yep. my condolences to uh, Vanessa and, the, and his sibling, uh, their siblings. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a rough time. But it's also a good time. I mean, I think, you know, we had that famous book. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The oxymoronic life. Yeah. And I think we always live with some of that tension. You know, you can look at the worst or you can say, how am I going to make this worst the best? And I think that that's what the journey we're all on. And it's called Life 101 or Life 1010 or Life 2020. Um, but it's called a journey. Sometimes my kids would quit with me and they would say, you know, mom, you're a trip. I said, no, I'm the whole journey. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've got me for the whole shebang and I've got you for the whole shebang. So let's, let's make it work. Let's make it worthwhile. Yeah. Life is an adventure. And, um, and I think it's going to be, despite the fact we're going through tough stuff, there's the reason for these things. And I think, um, there's an opportunity here that's, um, massively significant to uh to make um our communities really really um do fantastic yeah they can soar and they can thrive and so i'm i'm calling out all the people during the campaign the bloombergs who said they were going to help close the black wealth and uh, beyonce just formed a corporation i understand to help black women own businesses so if i can get to her i want to partner with her but i'm just you know i'm very thankful for the people who have platforms of influence who will share what they have with others and for whatever platform whatever size mine is i want to share it with others and partner with those who have 
a bigger platform so that we can touch more lives. There's a Jabez prayer in um, First Chronicles, uh, the Old Testament, and and it, the prayer of Jabez basically says, Lord, uh, touch my life so that I won't do more harm. And there was one version that says, God, let me touch more lives for you that you might get more glory. And I think that that's what I ask is let me touch as many lives as possible so that there may be a difference, that there may be a change, so that I'll be a game changer, a world changer, but most of all, a life changer. And if we can change one life, then I think that's worth living. Well, Ambassador, I think you've already changed way more than one life. And, uh, and I've already been influenced by you, whether it's in the food line at the event or on this interview. Um, and I certainly look forward to making some great things happen together um, in the very, very near future. It's my pleasure. And at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, youtube.com slash Ambassador Sujay. We have a conversation that I host. It's called Live with Sujay, and it's about to come on on the East Coast today. But I hope that you see it in every Wednesday. And if people want to reach me, they can reach me at ambassadorsujay.live. Send me your email, and I'll send you my seven steps to success. And a, and a thank you card. Yeah. Hey. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a joy, been a joy being you. with you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.